Season four of the Birdie Bunch podcast is brought to you by our Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash the Birdie Bunch podcast for more information. Hey there, nature lovers. Welcome back to another episode of the Birdie Bunch podcast, where we talk everything conservation, education, fascination. Today I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Dr. Brian Peterson. Brian, how are you doing? CJ, I'm doing great, and it's fantastic to see you. And thank you for inviting me to be on the Birdie Bunch podcast. It's an honor. Oh my gosh, of course, of course. Uh, some of our listeners may remember a few months ago when I was a guest on your podcast, All Bodies Outside. It was a really great time. We talked about uh, out in nature. We talked about like, queer inclusion in nature, access, all kinds of stuff. So I'm glad to have you on my podcast now. Yeah, CJ, likewise. And it really was a fantastic recording that we had. Um, I, it was a lot of fun. It was the first yeah. time that we had met and it was, it was, we were just having a great time together. And so I've been looking forward to reconnecting and recording again with you. So thanks. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. Well, I guess we'll just uh, jump right into our first segment of the day, which is our creature feature. I got a little sting. I don't know if you're familiar with our stings. We've got some fun stings here, Brian. Oh, no. Tell me more. Love it. Yeah. So we were talking about, uh, before we started recording, we were talking about what might our creature feature for this episode be. And you had mentioned that you were on a little trip. Do you want to talk about that trip before we talk about our creature feature? Yeah, yeah. So I, today is, we're recording on August 23rd. So for my summer vacation, I did a backpacking trip out to Yosemite National Park from August 5th to August 12th. And I did that with my partner and we went um, backpacking. We did a big loop out there. And uh, part of that loop, um, I was thinking about when we were pre-recording, you know, what types of wildlife did I see out there? And I saw a lot of deer, but I also saw marmots. Um, and so marmots, they're charismatic little creatures. They're super cute, um, but they also can be little, uh, they like my food sometimes. And so they're kind of fun. Like you got to watch your backpack, you got to watch your food with them, but they're also really cute to look at, especially when they're out kind of sunbathing on a big rock and just kind of yeah. taking in what's going on and observing and whatnot. So um, I recommended the marmot because of that backpacking trip because I saw several marmots out there. I mean, marmots are just, they're, they're real cute. I, I was learning this recently, kind of unrelated to this podcast, actually, but marmots are related to squirrels. Did you know that? I they're the largest did member not... of the squirrel family. Okay. And so the largest member of the squirrel family, now that you mentioned that, I can see the resemblance. Yeah. Um, and marmot so i was talking about this with my my partner when we were out backpacking in yosemite are they primarily storing up grass to to for the winter time because they go you know underground yeah and they are they got a long winter yeah they're one of like the few true hibernators so there's a lot of like animals that sort of like have like a kind of a hibernation like bears almost or they'll like technically sleep through winter but really they're sort of just like low energy Marmots are like truly like body functions, like kind of shut down for a little bit and like slow down to almost stopping. And they sort of get in these big groups and they have roughly about 200 days of hibernating through the winter. Wow. Like it's kind of wild. So like their heart rate goes from about 200 beats per minute down to about 30. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. They really shut it down. And this past winter, so I went backpacking out in California in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, um, you know, Yosemite national park. And that area got, had a very big winter slash spring of snow. I think they may have, I'd have to double check. I think they may have had historic snow levels. And so this year, I think the marmots probably pushed their hibernation beyond 200 days. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's wild. I mean, th it's been such a strange year with like weather patterns. I think last year was like El Nino. So like this year's weather patterns kind of are all janked up. Um, and then just cl climate change obviously is making yeah. you know, seasons strange as well. Um, yeah. Well, there was there was still snow. Uh, so I, oh I was gosh. backpacking around between like nine to 10,000 feet on average. I mean, I went up and down, right. but um, there was a lot of snow to still traverse. Um, and then speaking of wow. climate change too, I've been kind of loosely watching, um, Southern California get hit with, um, and I think it's their first time in 80 years getting hit with yes, it a is. tropical storm. Um, mm -hmm. and so that was pretty interesting. They've had quite a, 
a an outlier of a year for weather. Yeah, and I mean, there's been so many events like that, right? Like our winter here in Chicago yeah. was pretty mild this year. We didn't have a lot of snow. I don't think we had more than a, in six inches of snow this winter. Wow. We had we had like negative forty five degree temperatures. So like, oh it's, my gosh, it's like not what it should be. And you know, it's really interesting to see how wildlife's adapting to that too. For interest, like like the uh, marmots having a super long hibernation. Yeah, you make a really good point. And and so we're not too far away from each other, but there is a little bit of a distance. I'm in Kansas, yeah, you're yeah. in Chicago. And right now, so I've been living in Kansas since June of 2020, and we are by far the hottest I've ever experienced in Kansas. So we've been hitting yeah. about 106, 107 each day, full humidity. Yeah. Um, I got up this oh morning God. and went exercising before it was, it was light out. And I can't believe how much I, I sweated. <laughs> It was yeah. disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I think this has been a really hot week for us here in the city. It's been roughly a 100 every single day. Like we've had like heat advisories and like the park district is like opening yeah. their buildings for like people to take shelter if it's too hot. So it's, mm. I mean, climate change is, is affecting humans and wildlife. So it's definitely an interesting thing to think about kind of when you're reflecting on the impacts of global climate change. Yeah. And I, I think that's a wonderful point. Like, I think we often get um, wrapped up in like, oh my gosh, like I need to stay cool through this, this heat wave, yeah. but what are animals doing? Like we have foxes that live yeah. out here. What are they doing? Like, you know, like, I mean, they're yeah. probably underground, but they're probably still really hot. It's very humid. Um, and you know, it's probably not very comfortable for them. And so I think you, you have a good point there that let's think beyond the humans too. Yeah. I mean, think about these marmots, right? So they're, they're during their hibernation, they're body temperature drops from like a pretty normal mammal body temperature in the nineties down to like 40, 42. It's like, it's wow. a crazy drop in body temperature. If winters are even colder, will that have to drop even more? Will they even be able to survive a colder winter? Yeah. Right. Right. They're just not, would they even be adapted for that? Right. And then if yeah. the hibernation goes longer, like right, will they, they have enough energy to make it through that longer hibernation. Like maybe like a week or two, they might have enough energy, but like months, yeah. So think about like yeah. all the storage that they need to get kind of during that on season. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder for, Ooh, CJ, you're opening my mind. <laughs> I wonder, you know, for this, you know, we're talking about Yosemite national park, the Sierra Nevada getting what I think was historic snow levels. And, yeah. um, it was still very wet when I was there, August 5th, August 12th, there's mm -hmm. a lot of snow. A lot of mosquitoes, a lot of bugs. Like it felt like the start of spring, um, which probably means marmots had not been out that long themselves. Yeah, um, I wonder if there the was starts like September, October. So it's coming up soon. I wonder if yeah. So that effect too. So first off, did they have? Was there an impact on the population to get through this past winter? And now that they're out of um, hibernation, will they have enough time to store enough food? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And I know that it's a lot of, there's a, there's a focus of a lot of research with kind of like wildlife biologists who are studying kind of the impacts on climate change, but because it's such a slow change, it's tough to track over time, right? Like yeah. we can't, we can track it over like the sixties to seventies to eighties to nineties to now, but we can't track like year to year or week to week because it's just too big of a scale. Yeah. Um, so it's really wow. interesting. One thing that is, are we seeing, are we currently seeing more weather variability? I mean, I feel like it from my, uh, my outlook. It, it um, feels that way, right? Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of variability. Like there's not like kind of like we're got, we got highs, we got lows and everything. And it's yeah. like, yeah. So I wonder if weather variability is some sort of metric also being it's got to be it's got to be i, I, I mean, can't be yeah. having like unique idea yeah. here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry I'm, listeners i'm, sure, I'm not I'm, that <laughs> i'm sure that i'm sure that there's a, some research project at some university or some conservation organization that's happening that they're doing this research it's just not known to you or i right right um, yeah because like this has got to be studied somewhere because it's so fascinating to see how like you know I, I think people think about climate change. I either think about like global warming, like melting of the ice caps and like polar bears and like all of these things, 
or they think about like all the severe weather things like earthquakes and you know hurricanes and tsunamis and all these different things that are affecting humans but then i never think about like kind of like the less interesting animals or maybe like the mass populations of people so sort of like how we are being impacted as a species and how are like the day-to-day animals like marmots like foxes being impacted by these larger things like climate change yeah i think it's there's a lot of scales to climate change right like there's the big macro Fully. scales and those tend to get the media attention yeah but then you start going down the ecosystem level and the species level um you got smaller scales going on there um there's yeah. a lot of impacts going on at those smaller scales that aren't being covered by the media and and people probably aren't quite as aware of them um because mm-hmm. they're just not being covered as much yeah and i mean i think it's you mentioned a word right when we started talking about the marmots is this charismatic right yes and when we talk about conservation a lot of these animals that are really charismatic get a lot of that attention things like the polar bears the lions or the elephants get a lot of that attention from climate change and uh conservation issues but i mean marmots while they're not like endangered or anything they're still clearly being impacted like we can see that just through this conversation how marmots yeah. are being impacted by these small changes of climate change yeah, yeah. And um, I wanted to give a little bit of background on why I use the word charismatic. Please do. Um, so in the literature, there was a professor, I was a, I'm a, I, I got my PhD at Clemson University, and there was a former PhD student who studied the impact of, I think, bear viewing on people's experiences and whatnot. And, Super um, cool. and in his literature, he referred to bears as bears, but also referred to them as charismatic megafauna. Yep. And so that's where I got the charismatic from. And I was thinking about the marmots. They're absolutely charismatic. (laughs) I wouldn't call them megafauna, but mega rodents for sure. (laughs) That's good. That's good. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so that's our, that's our creature feature on, on the, uh, on the marmots. Any other thoughts on marmots before I move on, Brian? No, I think, oh, hey, my last thought is do not leave food out near them. They uh, <laughs> they would love to have that, and they should gather their own food, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so I didn't know this either, is that marmots are omnivores. They're not like pure herbivores like other uh, rodents. They're eating things like grasses and flowers, but they're also eating like insects and bird eggs and like carrion. So like whatever oh. they can find, they're, they're chowing down on. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, I just know that they've they've gotten into, like, if someone has a Ziploc bag of food, so say they sit down with their it. pack, they take, yep, exactly. They take out a Ziploc bag of food, put it next to their backpack, and then walk away 10 yards. Like, you better watch out. That bag might be gone. Those marmots. <laughs> sneaky, yeah, sneaky and charismatic. Largest of the sneaky. squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> nice incredible well let's move on to our main uh main topic which is chatting with you i'm gonna put our little sting in here okay i mentioned at the top i'm so happy that you're on the podcast um i want to talk first about all bodies outside can we talk about that first absolutely absolutely let's do it um so we talked a little bit a few months ago, just kind of off air, I think, when we were recording for your podcast. But talk to me about a little bit of the origins of All Bodies Outside. Yeah, so I remember a specific um, experience with my partner. And I had, um, so I'm an, I'm an avid runner. I've always been an avid runner. I uh, was a runner in elementary school, middle school, high school, college. I continue to do it. Um, I, I love the health benefits, mental health benefits, physical health benefits. Um, it's It's a way for me to connect with nature um I'm, I'm, I'm i love getting up and watching the sunrise while i'm running I, I caught it this morning um and it's also a way for me to connect with myself and so there's a, a spiritual component to it as well and i'm not i don't do too many races but back in 2021 i did do a race and um it was a hundred mile ultra marathon uh, so it's a very long and hardcore type of race and I got this big background in running and I, I, I um, have learned a lot through that. I know how to train myself and pace and whatnot. And I do pretty well at these races. Um, and so these races often have a, a maximum time that you can be out on the course. So it's like 34 hours or 36 hours. And the reason that there's maximum cutoff is there's a lot of volunteers out there. There's a lot of people helping 
and they need rest too. That like there just needs to be a point where like it's all done with. And so I finished this race in 2021 and I went back to my hotel. I took a shower, I rested, I woke up, I went to a restaurant, I had a hamburger. Um, and then I went back to the race around hour 32 and there was people finishing the race at hour 32, hour 33, and the cutoff was hour 34. And there's people coming in at like 33 hours and 40 minutes. And I was just like, oh my gosh, these people are so hardcore. They, like I've gone home and gotten to relax. They're still on the course going at it. And then that was the epiphany moment. That was like where my mind opened up to what are the stories that are not being told about people connecting with nature um, for the race that I was at probably a normative type of um, focus with the winners um, stuff like that. And not so much attention on these people that were finishing at the end. And so I started thinking about all these different stories that aren't being told about people connecting with nature that could be very inspiring for others to hear and then be like, okay, yeah, like I, I really, that resonates with me. I relate to that. And I'm going to do that too. And I'm going to connect with nature that way. So then I started thinking about um, all the social barriers and other types of barriers that um, people that signal out there that sometimes this place maybe isn't fit for specific types of people and it's fit for other types of people. And a lot of times that stuff is done on accident, but it, there's a kind of a lack of education behind it. And so I started thinking about social barriers. And in the end, I was just like, gosh, like it'd be great to cover these stories talk about these social barriers, talk about how people have overcome these social barriers to help more people get outside. Going back to what I said with my running and connecting with nature, I love the physical, but also the mental health benefits of it. And I think that um, if we were able to get more and more people outside, um, it could help with lowering healthcare costs. Um, and it's, it's just something that's a major contributor towards overall quality of life. Um, and so that is what led me to starting the podcast and naming it All Bodies Outside with the mission to get more people outside and to hear those stories that aren't covered nearly at all or as much as some of the more normative types of stories. That's spectacular. I mean, I, I don't know. I, as a podcaster myself, I love to hear like kind of the origins of podcasts. I have a friend who's been thinking about starting a podcast. I was like, just do it. Like, it's so fun. It's so interesting. And you meet all these incredible people. And what a like a beautiful story like to be inspired by all of these incredible people who are finishing their incredible journeys. That's so rad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I got to say that um, what you just said about podcasting, I did not foresee that, and it's true. Yeah, yeah. I have learned so much through um, putting on the Old Bodies Outside podcast. I'm at um, I've released seventy five episodes. Holy cow! Um, and yeah, I've released seventy five episodes, CJ. You were episode 40. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, your, your episode 40 re recorded on April 17th. No, no, no. We recorded on March 27th. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, it was a fantastic, fantastic episode, but you were referred to me through other people that I had on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's been something that I've just, Going back to those runners finishing at the end of the race and um, hearing their stories, I get to hear yeah. those stories on the podcast. I get to hear about people's perceptions of accessing nature. Is nature accessible at all places and all times? And how is that perceived? Yeah. Uh, there's just no way that like I would have known some of the stories that I've been told. And it, it's been wonderful. Every single recording is a wonderful experience. It's It's always great to connect with the guests and have an engaging conversation around this, this scope of connecting with nature and is it accessible? How can it be more accessible? Yeah, it's, it's something that I have a, a personal passion for is accessibility in nature. And obviously I think a lot of people know I'm on a uh, leadership team for our local organization called out in nature. So like queer access in nature. Um, I do a lot of personal stuff for like disability access in nature. And I think it's something that's so important is getting people outside. Because there's all of these benefits people don't even think about to being outside. Do you want to talk about some of those like benefits to being outside? Uh, you know what benefit just went through my head? It's kind of overly specific, but I was Please. thinking about vi vitamin D. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this, a benefit. It's a benefit. It is. I had a I had a conversation revolving around vitamin D yesterday uh, with my partner, and she. 
went to the doctor and got blood work done and kind of just did like an annual thing. And, yeah. um, she, she, her blood looked great. Um, but they talked about vitamin D levels. Her, her doctor talked about vitamin D levels and yeah. we were thinking about that. We both work in an office. Like I am a professor of park management and conservation, but my gosh, the high, high majority of my job is behind a computer. Yeah. Um, either at my home office or the university office. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I love to go running, but it's in the morning. Um, and the right. morning, um, like I'm not getting enough vitamin D at that point. I'm usually going yeah. running at like five 30 in the morning. Like it's very right. early. <laughs> <laughs> it's very early. I was up, I got up this morning at four 45 and, um, got out and did my thing and had some solo time, which was nice. That's um, but yeah, we're talking about vitamin D, but let's talk a little bit more. Like there's, um, in terms of going to the back, thinking about the backpacking trip that my partner and I just went on to Yosemite national park, um, the strengthening of our bond out in nature was amazing. And, and we, we actually, that's how we coined it. We were like, Man, gosh, like our bond felt strengthened after that trip. Like we were able to, you know, observe nature together. We were able to be in awe together. We were able to exercise together. And we had a lot of shared experiences out in nature together. And so we felt yeah. like our bond strengthened, um, which was the purpose of going on that backpacking trip. Um, going out in nature is also shown to help um, lower stress levels on people, yeah. um, helps them, you know, so I, I've, t I've had guests on the podcast, um, in which they've talked about, they are stressed out at work. It's 11 AM. Okay. I'm going to go for a 30 minute walk and they get back from the walk and they're able to overcome the problem that they were facing. They couldn't figure out they needed to clear their mind. So there's a lot of mental benefits associated with uh, getting out in nature. And I think the physical ones are pretty obvious, but there's a lot of mental ones. And for the listening audience out there, if you are interested in learning more, there's a fantastic book out there called The Nature Fix. Um, it's written by Florence Williams. And it, it, it summarizes all this research about the health benefits of getting out in nature. And it summarizes it in a way that is accessible. So speaking of another type of accessibility, I often write publications and manuscripts that are research oriented and they're not so accessible because they're very jargony. Oh uh, they're very dense yeah. and the nature fix, I recommend it because Florence Williams has a talent for making it writing in a way that's accessible for anyone, no matter what their knowledge background is. I love that. Um, and so I recommend reading that book. And then that book, I read it back in 2015 and it really inspired me to like, I, I, because I knew of all these benefits for going out into nature, I then felt inspired to make sure I get out in nature more and more. Um, yeah. and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, fitting it within my day. So it could mean 30 minutes at lunch or 30 minutes after work, whatever. Right. But getting outside and enjoying nature. And I think that when we're, we're discussing nature, it's also important to conceptualize that it doesn't have to be a national park like Yosemite National Park. This can be going to your urban park. This can be walking around the block, just getting outside. Uh, it doesn't have to be some sort of iconic nature setting. Um, you can make it iconic no matter where you go to. Um, it's just a mindset. And so for those that feel like they don't have great access, you know, think like you can find something around you. It's, whether it's an urban park, going for yeah. a walk, uh, somewhere, but those places are really, really important. I mean, the, the majority of citizens of the United States with, live within some sort of urban park, and it's a great way to yeah. access nature. Um, I've had guests on All Bodies Outside that um, they started accessing nature um, by just observing birds. And yeah. what's interesting is birding, and they, they had no background in birding. Um, they'd never been birding before, but they, they picked it up on their own. And birding became the means, an awesome means, but yeah. the means for getting outside. And so, you know, one of the things I recommend is finding your means. What are your means yeah. that will help you get outside? Do you enjoy walking? Do you enjoy birding? Do Maybe go journaling um, out, you know, in a local park or something like that. But find that means that will help you get outside. And I think that helps kind of with, um, okay, like, yeah, I'm going to. You don't think about it as I'm just going to go outside, but you think about it as, you know, having a purpose. I'm going to go journaling. Okay. I'm going to do it outside. Yeah. And then when you do it, you also get all those great benefits of being in nature. Yeah. One thing that I'm, I'm truly fascinated by is the concept of urban wildlife and, you know, living in a big city like Chicago, urban wildlife is something that it's, it's, it's 
really, really interesting and unique um, is, is, a, is a way to like look at how we think about wildlife. We don't think about like these big national parks or these big wild preserves, but wildlife exists and persists everywhere, especially in urban spaces. Um, it does. And I think knowing that the majority of people live in urban spaces and don't even think they have any access to any type of green space or any type of access to wildlife easily. Tr- truly, I mean, you couldn't have any more, you know, even just like a neighborhood park can have so much life and so much beauty that if you just take a little bit of a closer look, you'll get to see some of that really, really gorgeous stuff. Yeah. I remember. So I lived in San Diego for 14 years and uh, there is um, our big city park. I loved going there and watching the squirrels and um, they're pretty darn charismatic as well. Um, yeah, not, maybe as not, as as, the maybe not as charismatic as the marmots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they're always up to like something mischievous and having fun yeah. and um, their personalities are fun to observe too. And so, you know, maybe that's something to start with. And one of the great things, you know, CJ, with going out to uh, your local park, your local urban park is um, the more you get out there, the more you're going to discover of yeah. what you can observe. You're going to pick up on more and more. And I think there's yeah. – um, if, if you're, you're, you haven't gotten out to your urban park much, your local park much – you might assume like, oh, like I'm only going to see this, I'm only going to see that, but you never know. You never yeah. know. Like, and the more you get out there, the more you're probably going to um, have a, a more acute sense of observation for picking up subtleties that you'd never seen before. And that's really fun. Yeah, I was just a few months ago, I was uh, at, a, at a local park by me and I had seen a bird that I'd never seen before, a common loon, which is hanging out at the park. <laughs> cool. Why would that be at a random park in Chicago? You think about like, Kind of the the great north, like Minnesota or Wisconsin or the Great Lakes, having all of those kind of common loons, but it was just in the middle of a park in the city. Yeah, I don't know why, the, but it was so cool to see. Right, and and look what that does for you. You you, you kind of had this little like discovery, and yeah. you know you have a little bit of uh, some awe with it. Yeah, uh, maybe a sense of wonder, and uh, it's a great. It's just great for health. It really yeah. is. And again, you, you talked about like vitamin D already, but just like being outside brings people joy in ways that you can't explain. I think that was a big thing for a lot of people during the pandemic was finding ways to be outside. That was the thing that was missed from a lot of people. So going to the national parks, going just on walks, you know, that's what I, I was a birder before the pandemic, but I really picked it up during the pandemic because it was something just like, oh, I need to get outside right now. I guess I'll go look at birds. So, yeah. you know, I think it was, uh, this, this is the time. If you haven't gotten into being outside yet, now is the time. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And CJ, if you don't mind, I also wanted to, I don't know if you know this about me, um, but I have a, um, and it seems like everyone has side hustles these days, but I have a side hustle called backyard backcountry. And I didn't know this, tell me about it. It's to help people get outside in their backyard. I love um, that. So I described backpacking earlier and not everyone wants to go and sleep on the ground, the hard ground yeah. and, and rough it. And I personally enjoy that, but it doesn't mean everyone enjoys that. Yeah. And so my partner and I were talking about that. How can we help people go camping without the roughing it aspect? Yeah. Um, and so we started a delivery glamping business where people contact us and they say, Hey, uh, my friends and myself, we're going to have, wine night friday night we want to do it in our backyard and we'll come over around three o'clock on that friday we'll set up a glamping tent we'll do like a nice like cute lounge setup inside we yeah. got a movie projector we could bring like a solo stove bonfire pit uh s'mores kit um we can set up a charcuterie board um and then they have their their night in the glamping tent they're outside they're in the backyard it's very convenient there was no hassle no one needs to set anything up it's just set up for them. And then we return the next morning, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., tear everything down and take it away. And so that whole business right there, backyard backcountry, was to help people get outside into their backyards for those that maybe don't have the time to plan something, don't have the time to set anything up, yeah. don't, don't really enjoy roughing it at all. Like that does not appeal. 
Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, there's so many ways to connect with nature. You don't have to be the hardcore mountaineer person. Right. Uh, you know, like you can even do it in your backyard if you do have a backyard. So I live in rural Kansas. So, you know, it's a little bit different than, say, urban Chicago. Yeah. Um, but so that was a, a little side hustle that we started up and we usually get uh, we set up one or two setups per weekend of people going glamping in their backyards and we do it for all kinds of different things. And uh, one of the things that's really popular right now is for um, youth birthday parties. Uh, oh, that's so, so fun. Yeah. So we got a couple coming up that is uh, for a 12 year old birthday party, 13 year old birthday party, and they'll invite like five of their friends and we'll set up yeah. um, uh, twin mattresses inside of the glamping tent and they get to have their kind of independence inside of the tent, spend the night out there. We'll set up the movie um, projector screen. We'll put an AC unit in there. So I um, can put an yeah. AC unit in there that sucks out the humidity. Um, yeah. It has like an exhaust to it. It's almost like a portable office uh, AC in it. Yeah, and yeah. they stay nice and cool in there during the summer night. Um, and so it's just another way uh, that we were brainstorming to help people connect with nature. You know, and it, it goes back to, um, you don't have to be the hardcore mountaineer that loves a rough it. Like, you know, that's, yeah. there's people that are like that, but it's probably few and far between. Yeah. I, w I was talking with one of my friends recently about how there's like outdoorsy people and there's outsidesy people. Oh, I like that. Like outdoorsy people are like, yeah, I'm going to go rough it. Or I'm going to go on like a really like intense hike or like, I'm going to travel to this place and spend this time in this outdoors. And like, I'm like my time dedicated is outside. Uh huh. And oh, outside the people are like, just very much like, I like going on a walk. I like yeah. going to the beach. I love, you know, hanging out in the sun, but like, I'm not into the roughing it, right? So this is outdoorsy yes. and outsidesy. And I thought that was so fascinating to have my friend describe that to me. Oh gosh, CJ, I feel like you could do a whole nice little <laughs> research thesis on yeah. that in terms of- You feel like good. The, the continuum. I mean, there's, it's yeah. like this continuum um, yeah. from outdoorsy to outside. -y. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as soon as they, as soon as they said that to me, I was like, Oh, that's so good. That's so good. It's, like, it's, really, I, it's so good. Like, Oh, where do I fit on this spectrum? Right? Like, exactly. I feel like I'm more outdoorsy than outside Z, but maybe I'm not full outdoor. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, 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 and it, it, that, that fits so well to what we're talking about. There's just yeah. so many ways to connect with nature. And again, nature is all around us, whether you're in the city, whether you're in rural Kansas, nature is everywhere. Um, and that's one of the things I love to talk about with birding is that like you can be a birder literally anywhere because birds are literally anywhere. Yes. Like there's no yes. lack of birds anywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. Birding is such a great way to f find that means, like I was mentioning before, that purpose yeah. to get outside and use that as the, the fuel. For sure. Uh, what other kind of, I don't know, what is like the future of all bodies outside? Can you talk to us about that? Ooh, so I would say one of the tough things that I have run into with a podcast is, um, finding guests. Yeah. Um, I, I think finding guests is challenging and, and it's not just finding guests, but it, it's finding something that is going to be a productive and useful and inspiring conversation for listeners to connect with nature. Um, and so I'm, I'm always trying to brainstorm different ways, um, different veins. There's, there's, a, I don't know, there is a ton of veins of getting outside and I just have to think of it as a host. And so, yeah. Um, on my calendar, today is Wednesday, August 23rd. On Monday, August 21st. On Tuesday, August 22nd, I had down on my calendar to invite guests to Old Bodies Outside. I didn't invite anyone because I just was like, yeah, ah, like, like I need to like kind of find something that situates with, you know, what's, what's going on, what's trending, what's some ways to help out with outdoors, with yeah. people getting with Old Bodies Outside. And right before this podcast, um, I was looking up the, um, director of Kansas State Parks. Um, and I wanted to talk with this person to form a relationship with my program at Kansas State University. Yeah. I'm a professor of park management and conservation. And I, I sent a message to the director through LinkedIn. And I noticed that the director had gotten a, um, an award from Clemson University, which is my alma mater for my PhD. Right. So I started looking at all these different awards 
that Clemson University have been putting out for people that have done extraordinary work in terms of conservation. And one of the awards that I came across was Fran Manella. Okay. Um, and Fran Manella worked at Clemson University when I was there. She was the first female director of the National Park Service. Um, and so then I was like thinking, okay, like that's a vein right there. You know, who knows? Yeah. Like I'm going to reach out to Fran, but she's probably a little too busy to be on my podccast. Um, yeah. but I was like, and also speaking of like the director of, um, Kansas state parks, um, and, and, you know, thinking of these, these different, you know, going back to the race I talked about and these stories that aren't talked about as much with people finishing towards the end, they've been on the course way longer than they're honestly way more hardcore in my opinion. Um, what about in terms of veins of people doing extraordinary things with conservation and ways that yeah. they've helped out conservation? What are the stories that aren't being told there? And maybe it's, you know, female directors of state parks, of National Park Service. And so that's the vein I'm going to go down now to find guests. Uh, so finding guests is tough, but it, it's yeah. not just, you know, throwing mud on the wall either. Like I like to have a purpose behind it and find a vein that I think could yeah. have multiple guests within it. For sure. I mean, that's with uh, this new season of the Birdie Bunch, it's been me and a guest. It's been a little bit different from the way things have been happening in the past in this podcast, but it's definitely been a challenge to find guests on like a regular basis, especially that kind of align with like mission statements and align with like specific goals of what you want for, from your episodes. Right. And I was just thinking about, for your podcast, how cool it would be to talk about things like urban wildlife or talk about, talk about things like, you know, access to nature, um, in a variety of spaces. So, I mean, we can connect after I got some, some guest recommendations if you want. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, I, I did recently have a, a fantastic guest on here, Vanessa Mio, who, um, where is she at? I think she's in the Atlanta area. Um, but she is a mother of two or three kids and, um, she's like, Hey, look, I'm not a soccer mom. I'm not a football mom. Yeah. Um, I'm not a choir mom. Um, I'm not a dance yeah. mom. I'm a park mom. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love and so that. <laughs> she focuses on getting her kids out to parks and yeah. learning about all the different things that are in parks. And she even started a hashtag called park mom approved. Um, That's so great. Fantastic. And um, so she was episode number 72. I'm on, I, I just released episode 74. So she was very recently, yeah, I recently yeah. recorded with her. Um, but she had a big focus on, on urban access. But CJ, I will take you up on that because I think that is something that's great to talk about urban access, urban wildlife. Yeah. Um, so let's connect afterwards and yeah, yeah. Um, I'll be happy to get those guest recommendations. I'm always open to guest recommendations too. So for those that are listening out there and you're like, Oh, Brian, I got, you know, someone that'd be fantastic for old bodies outside. Yeah. Look me up on Instagram, uh, send me a message there or Facebook. Uh, yeah. you can also look up the podcast and I think, think send messages through spotify um but there's now, there's yeah yeah i think they that just started up um but i'm always open to guest recommendations so please send them um you don't you know unsolicited i'm fine with that go for it i'd be <laughs> yeah. happy <for> you. <laughs> um you, you mentioned earlier kind of how we connected for all bodies outside was somebody recommended me to come on your podcast and i yeah. believe correct me if i'm wrong that was Fran mcgregor yes yeah yes, so Fran was Fran mcgregor Freya was on the last episode of the Brady Bunch. So like just uh, before you was Freya. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was a chain reaction. Okay. Yeah, so tell us about it. let's hear about the chain reaction. Okay. So the chain reaction began with a former, so I, before I was a uh, professor at Kansas state university, I was a high school biology and chemistry teacher and I taught at a private school and I had a student um, named Van Levy. And Van is trans and currently doing so much great work for the trans community, um, doing so much great justice. And so I had Van on all bodies outside and Van and I have had a uh, relationship. Uh, we've been great friends for, I think, about two decades now. Wow. Um, yeah. And so uh, Van was uh, very early on the podcast, episode 16. And so at that point, oh my the goodness. podcast... I was inviting people that I'm familiar with, I'm comfortable with. Yeah. Um, I wasn't quite 
it took me about 20, 25 episodes to start inviting people like I'd never met. Yeah. Um, and so Van was one of those early guests that was uh, really generous with helping get the podcast going. And so um, I had a fantastic recording with Van and then Van started recommending people to me. And so one of the people that Van recommended to me was Tama Watts. And I had Tama Watts on episode 27. So 11 episodes after Van. Yeah. And Tama talked about how she, um, how birding just like really saved her life. She was going through a lot of stress and whatnot. And she started out with backyard birding, had no clue about birding. And she's now written a book about birding. She's gone yeah. on a national tour. Um, yeah. She's just super inspiring. And Tama was a lovely guest. Um, she's lovely to listen to. She, I just I love the way she delivers information. <laughs> um, she's fantastic to listen to. True. Uh, and so I had Tama Watts on here. And then Tama recommended Freya. So I had Tama Watts. So I had Van, episode 16, Tama, episode 27, and then Freya, episode 35. And okay. uh, Freya um, is the founder of Access Birding. Mm -hmm. um, and Freya is helping making sure that birding is accessible to everyone. And so one example that Freya gave that really stamped into my brain was that um, say someone wants to go birding that is uses a wheelchair for moving around. Yeah. And say they're on a walkway in which that walkway, it's say a bridge and it has um, waist level armrests for people that are bipedal, that walk around bipedally. Yep. Well, a person in a wheelchair, that's going to block their vision. Their, their eye level is going to be right at that, um, yeah. that level of where the guardrail is or armrest, if you would. What, what, what is that called? Is it, would you call it guardrail? Yeah, I would say like a guardrail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's one of the examples Freya gave. And so Freya also, birding is so, so healthy in her life and it's done so much great yeah. for her. Yeah. Um, and so she wants to make sure that birding is accessible to everyone, no matter what, uh, you know, it's just fully accessible to everyone. And so Freya was on uh, All Bodies Outside. And we had a fantastic time. She's so easy to talk to. So easy, um, yeah. Yeah, super easy to talk to. And I love learning about what she's doing. She's doing a lot of good for the world. Truly. Okay, so Freya, episode 35, then recommended CJ, episode oh 40. So that was the chain reaction that led to CJ being on Old Bodies Outside. And that led to you being on the Birdie Bunch. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bam. I love it. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wow. What a, again, what a story. I, you told me that when we first connected back in March, but hearing it again, it, it, I got, you can tell I got a big smile on my face right now. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, exciting. I, one of the things I needed to follow through with, and I guess, you know, I was talking about finding guests, but it I, it would be a lot of fun to have you, Freya, and Tama, or at least, I know Tama's very busy. She's touring yeah. with her oh book. God, but, truly. And I think Freya's got a book coming out too. Freya does have, Freya's working on a book too. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. So cool. It's, yeah. So CJ, look at this, like the birdie bunch, old bodies outside podcast. Um, it's, I, I don't know how to use a different word, but it, it's just been so amazing these guests yeah. to have on the podcast and to be able to connect with them. It, it's honestly a, just a wonder, a joy. It, it's always such a great time spent for my day. And it's something yeah. that it, it really fills my heart. It's something that brings me a lot of gratification. And um, I'm feeling all that joy as we're reflecting on this right now. Like yeah. it makes me so happy that I've had these wonderful guests. I mean, it's, it's, I never, yeah imagined these sensations when I started up the old bodies outside podcast. Right. I just figured I'd be talking to people helping with accessibility to getting outside and connecting yeah. with nature. Um, but it, it really podcasting fills me with joy and connecting with people. And, you know, like I said, I had to get over the hump of first inviting people that I know that I'm comfortable with. I have long lasting relationships with to then, you know, reaching out to people I don't know and, Van was someone that really helped me with that. So Van, if you're listening to this, thank you very much for kind of helping me ease into um, broadening my horizons with the podcast. Yeah. One thing when, when the Birdie Bunch was started, I mean, it was a point in time, like we started it in June, 2020. So it was just after sort of like that initial like shock of COVID-19. And we were all uh, conservation educators who had not been able to 
educate about conservation. And this is what we wanted to do. And so we found a way to do it through the Birdie Bunch podcast. And it's really grown and evolved to something so much more beyond that, right? Like I'm back now working in a zoo teaching, but that doesn't mean that this podcast can't go beyond that. Right. The connections that have been made through the Brady Bunch have been like so wild and crazy. Like Freya's become one of my best friends. Aww. Like and we've met through this podcast. Like it's really, really cool. The connections that's been made, it's been really cool the impact. Like I've had people come up to me like, Are you CJ from the Birdie Bunch? Like that's wow. weird. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's the community that forms behind the Birdie Bunch, behind the Old Bodies Outside yeah. podcast is, is true. And um, so yeah. I'm coming out to Chicago in early October for the Chicago Marathon. CJ and I yeah. are talking about connecting. Um, I'm going to the marathon because my partner is running the marathon and my brother. So I'm going to be supporting both of them out Incredible. there. Um, and part of the marathon is they have, I think the day before, like an expo. And you go and you check yep. in and get your bib. You can buy some um, some swag. Um, yeah. there's a couple of runners that I'm going to, that have been on the podcast that I'm going to, um, hopefully connect. We're going to try and connect. I mean, there's supposed That's to be, awesome. the race has 45,000 runners, so we're going to try yeah, and connect. Yeah. We're yeah, going to try yeah, and connect. We'll see what happens, but there's been, um, a couple guests on here that'll be at the Chicago marathon. One of them very notably that, um, was on the podcast twice. His name is Martinez Evans okay. and he went to the doctor at one point. The doctor is like, you're health is horrible you're gonna die um oh my God. and martinez is like well i need to start exercising you go running and the doctor's like i don't think you can like you're yeah you're, you're really bad in bad shape he didn't listen to the doctor and he started running and yeah. um he got better and better running he's run marathons um he's got wow just tons of experience and he wrote a book called um, I think it's called slow AF run club. So AF, you can that. imagine what that means. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Martinez is, he, he spread such a great message. He's like, look, like running is just a mindset. If you take one step, you're a runner. If you run one step, you're a runner. Don't worry about pace. Wow. Don't worry about anything else. If you run one step, you're a runner. I and love that. he helps, he tries to get people to adopt that mindset of like, yes, I am a runner. Yes, I can do this because he's had so many, so much health benefits, um, yeah. from running for his life. And so Martinez will be at the expo, I think, promoting his book. Um, and as exactly. I mentioned, he's been on Old Bodies Outside twice. Um, and then there's another um, guest that I recently recorded with. Um, I recorded with him on August 14th. So uh, what is that? Nine days ago, Jonathan Latson, And he's a runner out of uh, Washington, D.C., and he's going to be at the Chicago Marathon as well. So anyways, um, one of the things that is really fantastic with podcasting is the community that's formed. And yeah. um, I never thought about, I always thought about community being something that is spatially proximate. You know, yeah. Maybe that's where I went to, like, you know, relationships I formed with friends and family that are nearby. Um, but right. the 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 internet and social media it's such a great way to expand that community and you know enjoy yeah. the presence of other people that are up to great stuff in the world and so i totally agree with you um it, the podcast with forming community is it's that's another wonder of podcasting yeah it's again it's something especially like again being like a relatively like small podcast community right like i feel like our communities kind of overlap a little bit brian oh yeah um and it feels like a lot of the people kind of in these shared communities are just like genuinely really great people who are just really excited to learn about the outdoors. And that's yeah. all that you can ask for is somebody who's excited to learn about the outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that, that fits within your mission very well. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, kind of speaking about, uh, we've been talking about the podcast a lot. I want to, I wanted to also have you on to talk about some of your research. We talked again, mm -hmm. very briefly a few months ago about some of the really cool stuff. And I think it's time people hear about it. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what you do outside of yeah. all these outside? Yeah, so I am a professor of park management and conservation at Kansas State University. And I have um, two major research projects going on right now. One is a four-year project with the United States National Park Service. And that project um, is, is looking at um, how noise from aircraft affect 
people's experiences. And in fact, we know that people's experiences are affected. They get more annoyance. They're not hearing natural sounds as much. And so the National Park Service wants to mitigate noise impacts, not only for people, but also for wildlife. And one of the things is that a lot of people have become desensitized to aircraft noise, myself included. I'm definitely guilty. Um, in fact, I was um, collecting data just at my house to see how many aircraft fly over. And it was something like within the span of four days, like over 200 aircraft. And I do not hear them. I've become desensitized. Um, but research has found that aircraft noise, um, low level overflights is the most pervasive source of noise at United States national parks. Now you might think like cars, vehicles, well, they're only in the front country and yes, they are loud. We're talking pervasive, like expansive. And so there really isn't anywhere in the United States that is not impacted by noise from aircraft. And there used to be a time when um, the Olympic Peninsula, um, I don't know if any, anyone out there has read the book, One Square Inch of Silence, um, the, um, written by Gordon Hempton, who I, was a guest on my podcast too. Um, he, Gordon Hempton has gone around the world, um, for over four decades, he's now retired and, uh, recorded natural sounds. And he's very much aware of how much anthropogenic noise has been increasing. And so he refers to his natural sound as being an endangered species, um, to kind of get people's, um, attention and awareness behind how much human noise there is out there. And for those of you out there, I just use a jargon term, anthropogenic noise, that, that's human caused noise. Um, so my research with National Park Service is first off, we got many steps to it. We're looking at all the aircraft travel patterns and um, we're starting to 3D model, spatially model their noise impacts. And so kind of how that spreads out horizontally and up in altitude. But I did want to read um, a few paragraphs here, something that I wrote out recently that might help kind of listeners understand um, the situation. And so the United States national parks, the acoustic environment is a natural resource that is important for both wildlife and the visitor experience. It is comprised of biotic and abiotic sounds, as well as anthropogenic noise. Conservation of the acoustic environment is challenging because there are many sources of anthropogenic noise. Noise refers to undesired or unwanted human-caused sounds that degrade park soundscapes. The National Park Service aims to restore degraded soundscape at its park units. And to gain information about their soundscapes, acoustic monitoring is conducted, conducted to objectively examine acoustic resources, identify trends, quantify impacts, and provide useful information for mitigating noise. And with my research, combining those... Um, Aircraft travel patterns with the noise recordings will really help with spatially modeling these noise impacts. So anthropogenic noise challenges wildlife because it is loud, erratic, and increases competition for acoustic space. In the synthesis of two decades of research documenting the effects of noise on wildlife, Shannon et al. found terrestrial wildlife responses to noise begin at levels uh, similarly to the nighttime sound levels found in typical residential areas. So it's pretty low. This is nighttime sound levels of residential areas. And so that is when wildlife begins to be affected by noise levels. Documented effects of noise <clears throat> on wildlife behavior include shifts in vocalizations, foraging behavior, mating behavior, vigilance, movement, and physiology. Um, this research concluded that noise is detrimental to wildlife and natural ecosystems, and noise effects span from the individual to the community level. Um, now, shifting to the visitor experience, the acoustic environment is 100% integral to the visitor experience at national parks. Natural sounds have been shown to improve health, increase positive affect, and lower stress and annoyance. Um, some earlier studies in the United States identified that experiencing natural sounds is an experiential attribute sought by national park visitors. Um, at Denali National Park and Preserve, 67% of research participants reported sound-related motivations were very or extremely important for their visit, uh, which suggests natural soundscape experiences are desired by visitors. 
Um, yet the same study found aircraft noise was consistently one of the most unacceptable sounds evaluated. Um, research at Muir Woods National Monument found that noise is deemed unacceptable when it passes um, a level just a little bit below what is uh, equatable to nighttime sounds of residential areas. Um, and even more concerning is research found that only 11.3% 11 of national parks have low audibility of anthropogenic noise. So that means the high majority have high audibility of anthropogenic noise. Um, so this is something that's really, really important. So my piece of the research is right now we are figuring out aircraft travel patterns of low level overflights over national parks. And so what we're doing with that is we collect a type of data called ADSB. And that's um, an acronym that is filled with jargon terms, but it stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance broadcast. And what it essentially is, is it's two pieces to it. In an aircraft, it's connected to the satellite navigation system, the global positioning system, GPS. So it's getting GPS, it's getting its latitude, it's getting longitude. And then what the ADSB system does is it, it transmits out radio waves to other aircraft and says, hey, this is where I'm at. This is my identification number, my unique identification number. This is my latitude, my longitude, my velocity. And it transmits this out twice per second. That way other aircraft can pick it up and they know where other aircraft are in relation to them. And so it's a major boost in safety. Well, these radio waves that are transmitted out are unencrypted and publicly accessible. And so we've been setting up um, uniquely designed ADSB data loggers in the back country of national parks and collecting all these um, aircraft travel patterns, picking up all those um, radio waves that are transmitted out twice per second and then putting together all the waypoints to understand their routes, their altitudes, their horizontal velocity, their vertical velocity, um, how high are they flying in terms of above mean sea level and how high are they flying above ground level. And the latter above ground level is so important for understanding noise impacts. Noise impacts are often found to be, um, if, if a flight's below 2000 feet above ground level, there's gonna be a significant noise impact. Um, and so we not only have been collecting that ADSB data, but we wrote um, some software to analyze that data because that data can be really, really big. So, for example, at Grand Canyon National Park across a few years, we collected over 43 million waypoints. So this is really hard to uh, process and analyze because it's so many waypoints. So we wrote some unique software for the National Park Service to be adopted by the entire National Park Service so that they can um, easily, intuitively uh, analyze ADSB data that's collected in their um, backcountry of their park unit. Now, ADSB data only shows aircraft travel patterns, but those aircraft travel patterns can, uh, where they are concentrated and when they're below certain altitudes, can certainly be used as a proxy to know where there is um, noise impacts related to aircraft and where those are and when they are occurring. Now. When we're talking about aircraft here, we're talking about low level overflights. We're not talking about Southwest Airlines up at 30,000 feet. Um, we're talking about more so air tours that are happening in the park. There's a lot of companies that um, get permits to conduct air tours within park units. Um, and now that, that's not to say that say Southwest Airlines at 30,000 feet have a noise impact. They do, and they also have a visual impact. You know, when I'm out in nature, I really don't wanna see a ton of flights going on above um, that are visible. Um, but in terms of managing, so this is where there is, there's challenges, managing low level aircrafts, managing overflights. Um, it's a lot harder for the National Park Service to go to Southwest and to change those travel patterns that they have, because those travel patterns are meant to be direct and efficient for moving people around. Um, and it's found to be, you know, something that's really important for the economy, getting business moved around and whatnot. So those are really hard to manage and to change. But National Park Service has done that before. Um, a lot of these flights follow different waypoints in the sky and they'll hit a waypoint and then they hit the next waypoint. And so if there's a waypoint over the National Park that is um, starting to create a lot of flights overhead, a lot of noise from those types of commercial airlines, um, Rocky Mountain National Park was one park that actually did move that waypoint before. But for the most part, this research is focusing on low-level overflights that are known to cause a significant noise impact to the acoustic environment um, and then those low level ore flights are a lot easier for National Park Service to work with those operators, to educate them. National Park Service isn't out to be, you know, get rid of their business. They're looking to educate them, say, hey, fly, fly higher. Can you please go around this heritage site? 
Um, this is a place where there's a lot of people. Can you please go around it? Um, and so they're educating operators on ways that they can still give, say, an air tour in which they have pain clients, but not have as noise impacts in areas where there's as many people or there's sensitive cultural resources and stuff like that. So that's one of my projects that I'm currently doing. Um, it's one that um, I, I really love a lot. And it's, as I mentioned, it's a four-year project and something that has really uh, got a big piece of my heart with it. How far into that four years are you? Yeah, CJ. Um, <laughs> I believe two. Okay. Uh, I've lost track of it. Yeah, I believe two, uh, maybe a year and a half. Um, and it's, uh, we right now are doing analysis at Olympic National Park, okay, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and Haleakala National Park. Um, uh, for Haleakala, our data was collected before the wildfires that recently, yeah, um, went through Lahaina. Um, and then I think we'll be analyzing Glacier National Park, and we had a couple others that we're gonna be, um, analyzing as well. Okay. Um, with that project and um, assessing what they're, because not there's quite a few park units that have aircraft noise impacts. And there's also quite a few that do not. Um, sure. Not every single one does. Yeah. I guess what has been the most interesting, or maybe even the most rewarding part of doing this research. So we get the so the park unit will collect the data. Yeah. And they send it over to me and my team at Kansas State University, and we process and analyze it. And then we put together a report. Usually for each park, the report's between 50 to 60 pages. Yeah. It's got a ton of figures, like maybe like 30 figures, 10 tables. Sure. Um, and then once the report is ready to go, it's been approved by some scientists that are overseeing the project, the National Park Service, we then present it to that park unit. So when Got it. we finish with Olympic National Park, Haleakala National Park, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, we present it to that national park and we meet with all the managers, the director of that national park, the superintendent. Yeah. Um, and every time it's, it's so great because when we present it, we're just a piece of the puzzle of trying to mitigate noise impacts. Yeah. So we're just doing the analysis, but there was everything that we, we weren't a part of. There was someone out there that deployed the ADSB unit. There was someone out there right. um, gathering the data, recording it, storing it, someone that shipped it over to us. Um, and so there's, it, it's a lot of fun to present it to the national park service unit for whatever unit it is, because at that point, everyone comes together and we're all like very interested in this role. Uh, you know, have put a lot of passion and time into it. And the ultimate goal with some of these places is to um, twofold to write an uh, air tour management plan and to write a soundscape management plan. Yeah. Soundscapes have been found to be so important, according to research, for a variety of reasons. I mentioned some of them for wildlife, for the visitor experience, that the National Park Service wants to um, create soundscape management plans to keep those natural sounds conserved for a lot of generations to come. That's awesome. I guess. Yeah. No, go ahead, please. And, well, I was going to say, you know, I think with one thing that uh, with the, my research and that is it, birds are such an important aspect of that. Um, and there's a lot of research on birds being highly affected by anthropogenic noise. Um, there's a study that was done in Hawaii about helicopters and their yeah. noise on bird songs. And that has all types of negative effects on their behaviors. I mean, there's so many especially out in Hawaii. There's so many bird species who are like, numbers are drastically dropping right now. I mean, there was this whole like avian influenza thing this past summer or the past few summers, really, that's been spiking. You know, we've had uh, increases in, you know, deaths uh, from birds via introduced species like domestic cats. We've had a lot of window strikes all over the country. And, you know, it's human impacts on wildlife are really never ending. And it's something that I feel like we because humans are so desensitized to some of that noise, like you mentioned, I feel like we're almost like forgetting about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like all of these things are happening and we're just like, yeah, but like what is happening? You know what I mean? Right. And I really recommend doesn't feel to, that way. No, you're absolutely right. And I recommend, you know, I'm going to bring it back up, but I recommend reading uh, one square inch of silence by Gordon yeah. Hampton, because that really helps with understanding how prolific yeah, uh, this problem is of anthropogenic noise and affecting um, 
parks, protected areas, nature. Um, like it, it's a, it's a, it's a major problem. Yeah. That's uh, such fascinating research. I'm so glad you got to come out and talk about it because it's so cool. Like it's something that I would have never even thought about as like a research topic. Right. We mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, podcast and we're doing our creature feature like oh wow what a cool question i bet somebody's researching this and i'm sure there's somebody (laughs) else on another podcast going i bet there's somebody researching like planes over national parks like how that noise impacts wildlife i bet that exists right and it's so cool that you're the one to study that that's so rad yeah i'm really lucky i'm really fortunate and um it's on a lot of levels, on a lot of levels. And one of the levels is being that I, I personally think it's really cool yeah. and extremely beneficial. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if if you got to pick your research study, would you still pick something like anthropogenic noise? Yes. 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 Um, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think it's that important. So cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Before we sort of wrap the podcast, what else... Uh, what else is on your mind for the, our Birdie Bunch listeners? Ooh. Um, so what is on my mind for the Birdie Bunch listeners? Yeah. I would say for, you know, I, if you don't mind uh, talking a little bit more about the Old Bodies Outside podcast. I would love if you to. I would love to. Haven't, if you haven't gotten outside today, take the time to, you know, walk 10 yards outside of your apartment. If you have a house, walk to the end of the driveway. Um, and, and take some, some breaths of fresh air, Yeah. um, do that for lunch and, um, you know, use that as a way to start connecting with nature more and more. Um, the health benefits are fantastic. Plus the fun is there too. Yeah. Um, Even if it's like super that, hot, the, the benefits are outweigh yeah. the 10 seconds of heat. <laughs> yeah. And you'll probably find a cool, cool bird to observe and so. don't, don't put, don't put any pressure on yourself of having to ID it. Just observe it. Just observe the yeah. uniqueness of it, the colors of it, and observe yeah. it in your unique way. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's spectacular. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, if you don't already, go listen to All Bodies Outside. You can find it anywhere podcasts are found. And you can follow them on Instagram at All Bodies Outside. Yeah. Are you yeah. anywhere else that people can find you? So I'm on Facebook threads and Twitter oh, with the threads the same too. Oh, I haven't made the I haven't made the move of threads yet. Wow. I, I, so I, I primarily am on Instagram and every Instagram post, I send it to threads. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I decided when threads got going, I might as well get going with it too. That's fair. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, going back to my recommend or my, 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 my um, plead for help. Yeah. <laughs> if someone has, you know, some good guest recommendations, message me on Instagram. That's the one I'm most active on. Um, and you can send me a cold message. I am comfortable with that. Introduce yourself, whatever. And let's hear about some guest recommendations because that is something that I'm always looking to deliver quality and accessible content. Those are, those are two tenets that are very, very important for every podcast, quality and content, or sorry, yeah. quality and accessible content. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, incredible. Uh, so yeah, go listen to All Bodies Outside. This podcast, the one that we just recorded right now is going to be posted on both uh, feeds. So if you're a follower of All Bodies Outside, hello. If you're a follower of The Brady Bunch, hello. Um, so you get to hear this beautiful, wonderful podcast with these two great people on both feeds. Um, yeah. You can follow The Brady Bunch on Instagram, Facebook, pretty much wherever, at The Brady Bunch Podcast. Um, I mentioned it during the podcast, but our uh, our social media has been a little slow because I've had big summer programs, but we're picking it back up. Fall's here. <laughs> Um, you can also, um, find us at our website, the pretty much podcast.com, or you can support us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the pretty much podcast. I want to give a quick shout out to a couple of our patrons, uh, Killian Becker, Gabe Anderley, and, uh, your name here is pretty penny. So thank you so much for supporting the pretty much podcast. And a few of those, uh, lucky patrons are getting this as a video recording at uh, not just audio, which is really exciting. And then I also wanted to note that when we post it for the All Bodies Outside feed, it'll probably be video as well, right? On Spotify. So I will do it uh, video and audio on Spotify. On Spotify. And then, um, I also upload it to YouTube too. Spectacular. So if you aren't a patron, but you still want to see the video of this podcast, like, I don't know if I'm into the videos. You can go check it out at uh, All Bodies Outside on their Spotify or YouTube page and see if you're, see if you're into the videos. Spectacular. 
Um, well, thank you again, Brian, for being here. This has been so fun. I've really enjoyed having you here. Um, CJ, it's been it's been a blast. It's been a blast, and yeah. let's let's do um, another recording maybe in the new year. Um, I would love that. Twenty twenty four. Let's I keep. Um, I, I love what you're doing with the the Birdie Bunch. Um, I wrote down your mission pre recording. Your mission to inspire an inclusive community for conservation by using education to promote fascination. I think your mission aligns so well with Old Bodies Outside podcast. So, um, and both so. times we've recorded, I've had such a good time. So let's <laughs> let's make sure we keep this collaboration going. I think so too. I think it's a good collaboration. Um, well, spectacular. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we will catch you next time. We did it, Brian. We did it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>